Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. Today we're gonna to be looking at some inferior pathologic Q waves. To set the stage for us, we've got a 79-year-old male. We know he has a history of coronary artery disease. And he tells you he just got the vaccine yesterday for COVID and now he's feeling he's got body aches, he's super tired, um, has a fever, and he just feels very weak. So weak, in fact, that he tried to get up to go to the restroom and he had a sinkable episode because his legs just collapsed out from under him. So you find him laying on the floor, you are called for a fall get a set of vitals like we always do. Look good, he's mildly tacky um, with a good blood pressure, 159 over 85, satting 92, his blood sugar is normal, but he is febrile at 102.4. So you go ahead and get a 12 lead because he's feeling so weak, and this is what you see. I'll let you take a look at that for a second and come up with your own diagnosis and then we'll go through it together. So as we start, same way every time, we look at our rate. Rate is 97. I'm gonna just check with my thick red line and make sure that marches out. So I start here, the QRS lines up on the thick red line, 300, 150, 100, just less than 100. I agree with the computer. As we move on to assess our rhythm, we ask, is there a P wave before every QRS? And is this rhythm regular? So I do see a P wave, we look in lead two. Um, and I follow that out. There's a P wave before every QRS. Here, a little hard to see here, but I look down here and I can see P waves as they march out. This one kind of stands out to me because it looks a little bit long, um, but I do see P waves all the way out. I'm gonna look at our PR here. Let, again, let the computer do the work. The PR is greater than 200 there, and so this counts as a first degree AV block. But it's still regular. There's still a P wave before every QRS. And so um, we have a first degree AV block. That's the first thing we found. And then next we move on to our axis. So we look at leads one, leads AVF. Remember we use our thumb, left thumb is lead one. The QRS vector is mostly up in lead one. Left thumb is up, AVF. Actually the QRS vector here is mostly down. So our right thumb is down. We've got left thumb in the air, which gives us left axis deviation. And as we move on to look at our intervals, the two most important ones that we're looking at are our QRS. We want that to be less than 120. It's at 98, we're good to go there. And then our QTC, we find right here, it's 418, that's less than 450. We're good to go on our intervals. And lastly, we get to look at our ST segments. And so this is where I've got some things that really catch my eye, um, but we'll do this the same way every time. So we look at two, three AVF, these are our inferior leads, and I'm looking for any ST elevation, T wave inversions, anything that would suggest ischemia. And I almost think I see just a subtle bit of ST elevation here in lead three, but I don't really see it in AVF, so it doesn't quite meet stimming criteria. It's not greater than, than one box, but it caught my eye. As I move to the high lateral leads, um, again, like pretty steady across the baseline there, but this T wave is inverted in AVL, which always is a reminder to look at your inferior leads. As we move to the septal leads, I don't see any ST elevation or T wave inversions there, but as I move over to V4, V5, V6, we do have T wave inversions here. No depression really of the baseline, but T wave inversions, which can be an early sign of ischemia. So what I've got here is um, T wave inversions in the lateral, anterior lateral leads, and then a little bit of elevation in lead three which could be, I would get another 12 lead pretty quickly after this one to see if anything evolves and you start to develop more ST elevation here in the inferior leads. These are very subtle changes. But the other thing that's worth noting, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, is these Q waves. Do you see how there's a big downward deflection, big downward deflection in all of the inferior leads of that initial Q wave of the QRS complex. And let's talk about those for a second because they can signify different things. Some of them can be normal depending where they are, but there's such thing as pathologic Q waves. And that means that something either has happened in the past or is going on right now and you need to be in tune to it. So historically, they've been attributed to an old MI. It can either be acute, 
as, as somebody is infarcting, you may start to see those Q waves develop and deepen and start to get wide, or it may signal that something old has happened. And basically when you see a Q wave, that's just electrically silent muscle tissue. That tissue is dead or unable to conduct electricity. It tells you they're an old infarct. Sometimes it can actually be a cardiac tumor or some sort of infiltrative disease, like a rare disease like sarcoidosis or something like that. And I read an interesting study yesterday that if you see Q waves in young people, um, doesn't necessarily always mean that they've had a heart attack, but there was about a 90% significance and sensitivity for at least some underlying cardiac disease. So you need to be able to look out for these Q waves because they may signal that something is going on in the heart. And here's a picture that you can see with an old infarct. As somebody who survives a heart attack, the, the muscle that dies, it turns into this white fibrous tissue that you can see doesn't connect, probably conduct electricity very well. And as infarcts evolve, this is in the setting of an acute infarct. This is 30 minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks, how this evolves over time. And you can see these Q waves here. When he's having the infarct, when it's only 30 minutes old, the Q wave is there, but it's very small. And as as more and more tissue dies as he's waiting to get that reperfusion done, the Q wave widens and deepens and gets pretty profound. And then as he survives his heart attack, but that tissue is dead, it's not coming back. And so he's going to have a big Q wave for a while and then over months to years, it may resolve a little bit, but you'll still be able to see it. And so that's what that looks like. Just a reminder on a normal QRS complex, the Q wave should be very tiny, very narrow. It's just the initial downward deflection before the big R wave and then the other downward deflection of the S wave. And so a pathologic Q wave, we have criteria to recognize those. Basically, it needs to be one small box wide, which we have here, two small boxes deep, which we have here, and then about 25% of the depth of the QRS complex. I don't really pay much attention to that one, but any Q waves ever in lead V1 through V3 and it present in two contiguous leads. And so if we look at our 12 lead again and we evaluate these Q waves here, it is greater than one small box wide, greater than two small boxes deep, and then it's present actually in three contiguous leads. And so it's hard to tell. I would agree with the computer. There's an inferior infarct, but it's hard to tell. Is this ongoing? Because if you remember, we saw some elevation here. Doesn't quite meet STEMI criteria because we don't see it in more leads, but there are some reciprocal changes. And so I would keep a very close eye on this one because either there's old dead tissue right there that's causing some conduction abnormalities or there's something acute that's going on. But overall, if we look at this 12 lead, we've got a normal sinus rhythm rate of 97 with a first degree AV block, pathologic inferior Q waves, uh, and some T wave inversions in V4, V5, and V6. So I would call this, at first glance, it may not look that concerning, but as you look closer, you can see there's some concerning findings on here. So that is all for today. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you next week.